The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians in chapter 6, verses 10 to 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. We are engaged at the moment in particular in a study of the wiles of the devil. To the Apostle Paul, this was a most important matter for all Christian people. And he is anxious that they should know something about these wiles and their manifestation. You note the note of urgency in the way in which he puts it. The position is such that nothing but the whole armor of God is enough to shield us and to cover us and to enable us to withstand. Are you, my friends, conscious of this fight? Or do you find the Christian life something easy and simple? Are you aware of no conflict? Well, if you are, you're in a very different condition from the Apostle Paul and from all the saints who've ever adorned the life of the church. We do literally wrestle with these powers. We are confronted by the wiles of the devil. Now, we've been dividing our consideration of the wiles of the devil into two main sections. There are certain general activities of the evil one which have been very manifest in the history of the church and uh, which are, are indicated here in the pages of the New Testament. But in addition, there are certain uh, ways in which he attacks us individually and personally. Now, I think this uh, classification is a very important one. There are certain big things that we have to be aware of as members of the Christian church. The church as a whole is confronted by these wiles, but then in addition to that, individually and personally, he comes to us in different ways and we have to be aware of that in order that we, being prepared, may be able to withstand it. Now we are considering the general manifestation so far. And we come this morning to what, as far as I'm concerned, at any rate, is the last manifestation of the wiles of the devil in this general way. We've already considered how he has thus uh, attacked the church and tried to destroy the work of our blessed Lord by means of heresies. We've also considered the question of apostasy. And then the last two Sundays we've been considering the sin of schism. It's all here in the New Testament and as I say it has now last been illustrated far too frequently in the subsequent history of the Christian church. But now we move on to a new consideration, and that is the whole question of the cults. Now, you notice that uh, I am not proposing to consider uh, the so-called great world religions, such as Mohammedanism, or Buddhism, or Hinduism, or Confucianism, etc. Now, I think it's important that we should understand and realize why I'm not proposing to consider them with you as we look together here at the wiles of the devil. My reason is this, that in reality they do not belong to this matter. The Apostle Paul is here particularly concerned about the wiles of the devil as manifested against Christian people. Now, those others are not uh, in any way connected with or related to Christianity. They are, of course, a manifestation of the activity of the devil in general, but not this particular activity about which the apostle is concerned here. There is no doubt at all that the devil persuades people to believe in those so-called religions and thereby keeps them from God and from Christ. But what he's concerned about here is the subtle temptation that comes to those who are already believers. Now, it's a very rare thing 
Uh, indeed, I wonder whether it's ever happened in a sense that a Christian has turned to any one of those other religions. I know there are many nominal Christians. There are many people who think they're Christians and who've been brought up in the Christian church who've done that. There are many such in this country who have turned to Buddhism in this present century. Now, I'm not considering them. The apostle is concerned about true Christian people, those who are born again and do know it. That's what he's concerned about. So I would exclude from the discussion at this point those various other so-called world religions. We are interested in this special sense in the way that the devil comes to true Christian people and with all his subtlety and in the manifestation of all his wiles presents to them something that at first appears to be Christianity but which in reality is not Christianity at all. Now then, that brings us uh, to this question of the cults here. And again, it is important that we should be clear in our minds as to the difference between heresies, apostasy, schism, and the cults. What is a cult? Well, a dictionary definition is quite good. It says it's a devotion to a particular person or thing so uh, as paid by a body of professed adherents. That's quite a good definition. I take it out of the Oxford Shorter Dictionary. It is devotion, you notice, to a particular person. Now, we'll see that that's very important always in this matter. Or some particular teaching. But generally, it's a person as well as a teaching. And it's a devotion that is paid to such a person and to such a teaching by a body of professed adherence. Now, there are large, there's a large number of cults. I give you some uh, examples just to uh, make it clear as to what we are discussing. Here are typical cults, Christian science, theosophy, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christiadelphianism, positive thinking, the unity school of Christianity, anthroposophy, the science of thought, Mormonism, and various others which we could mention. Now, I haven't given you an exhaustive list at all, but I've just mentioned those in order that you may understand the kind of thing that we're considering. There are, of course, in addition, various forms of psychological teaching and thinking which also are cults, but they haven't always got a name. Sometimes they're taught from so-called Christian pulpits, but it's nothing but a form of psychologism. It's nothing but psychology. It uses Christian terminology, as they all tend to do, but it's nothing to do with Christianity. It's pure psychology, and there is a great deal of that. You sometimes also get it in various forms of mysticism. It's one of the great dangers in connection with mysticism. There is, of course, a true Christian mysticism. The Apostle Paul, I would say, was a Christian mystic. In other words, what uh, we mean by mysticism is that a man is concerned not only with uh, an intellectual grasp and understanding of the truth, but that he has a living and a vital relationship with God and with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the emphasis always of the mystics, the inner life, the living, experimental, experiential aspect of the Christian faith and the Christian position. And, of course, it is absolutely vital. If our uh, so-called faith doesn't lead to any kind of experience, well, then I take leave to doubt whether it's Christianity at all. This is a life, and it's living, and it's real, and it's experimental. But the danger always is that the devil comes in at that point and turns what is a true Christian mysticism into something that ceases to be Christianity. In other words, I'm venturing the assertion, which I could prove if I had the time, that the greatest danger always with mysticism is to bypass essential Christianity. In other words, the system, the mystical system and method, becomes so important that the Lord Jesus Christ himself becomes comparatively unimportant. Well, there are various types of mysticism. And you know there are various uh, forms of... Uh, an admixture of uh, Eastern philosophy and mysticism, which tend to be popular, the yogi philosophy 
I gather from some of the journals, is becoming increasingly popular in this country. And there are people who are turning to it and becoming its devotees. Now there are, in general, uh, illustrations of uh, what we mean by the cults. Let me say at this point that if you are anxious to um, know about them in detail, well, there are many books that can help you to do so. There is quite a small booklet called Some Modern Religions by Oswald Sanders and Stafford Wright. It's only a two-shilling booklet. I think it's important that people should read a book like that because these things are confronting us. There it is in very simple form, uh, some modern religions, or a larger book by Oswald Sanders called Heresies Ancient and Modern. There's another book called Some Modern Substitutes for Religion. There's a book called Religious Fanaticism by Ray Strachey, who was a granddaughter of Mrs. Hannah Whittle Smith, one of the founders of the Keswick Convention. Uh, that's quite an interesting book on various religious movements, freak religious movements in the United States of America in the last century, which were all cults of various types and kinds. And there is a, a quite an interesting book. And then, uh, if you want something more learned and still more solid, one of the two volumes on perfectionism by the great B.B. Uh, Warfield. Now, there is literature. You will find also in many religious uh, bookstores and shops there are little booklets, uh, even smaller than the one I've mentioned, which tabulate the various beliefs of these uh, cults. And uh, it's a very convenient way for considering, so that if you're suddenly confronted by one of these things, you can turn up your list. Well, I'm saying that all this is very important. Why is it important? Well, it's particularly important at a time such as this. The history of the past uh, demonstrates very clearly that there are certain times when uh, the cults become a particular and an exceptional danger. And uh, there are always, of course, times of crisis, times of trouble, times of war, of the threat of war. I think this is something which is quite obvious. There's no difficulty in understanding all this from the mere standpoint of psychology. Whenever we are hard-pressed or when we are in trouble, we, we always want relief. We are always seeking for help and for comfort and for guidance. Well, that's just the opportunity for the wiles of the devil in the form of cults. Now, it not only happens, of course, at such a time, but uh, bereavement and sorrow or ill health or some uh, mishap in life or some business anxiety or worry or anything like that. Anything that makes life difficult for us. And we feel hemmed in on all sides, and we begin to fail in every respect. Health fails, can't sleep, and so on. Now, these are just the very conditions in which the cults tend to flourish and to thrive. And therefore, there has never been a time, perhaps, in the whole history of the world when the cults have had a greater opportunity than just this present time. And that is why they are flourishing as they are. We've had two world wars. The whole state of the world since the last war has been unsettled and uncertain. There's this horrible threat over us the whole time. And life has become difficult and involved, perplexing and trying. Now that's just the situation in which I say the devil puts forward these counterfeits. And therefore, it behoves God's people at this time of all times to be perfectly certain about these things. Now I'm not proposing to go through these one by one. It would take far too much time. And in any case, it wouldn't ultimately be profitable. What I'm going to do rather is this. I'm going to deal with them in general because there are certain principles that are common to them all. This is to me a very interesting thing. There is a fundamental pattern in all these. Of course, there are many variations, but the pattern is always one and it's always essentially the same. Therefore, if we do get hold of these central controlling principles, it ought to be a comparatively easy matter to apply them to these various cults as they happen to confront us. Now then, let us proceed to do this. This, I say, is interesting because it is an indication always of the hand of the devil. There's a kind of 
common plan. The master hand is to be seen always if you look for it at the back. Uh, the devil, you see, is the, not only the great antagonist of God, he is the great counterfeit of God. There is and there's nothing more wonderful about God's work than the way in which you can trace a common fundamental plan in the work of God. In nature you see it, you see it everywhere. In all aspects of the Christian life, there's always a fundamental plan. That is why it's important we should always know that fundamental plan, that's theology. However, now I'm trying to show you that it's true of the counterfeit also, that he tends to do everything in the same way. Not always the same color, not always exactly the same shape, but it's the same fundamental constitution. Very well, then what are these characteristics? Well, first and foremost, there are certain things which are common to them all. I mean by, by, by that apart from this fundamental plan. And I mean things like this. All these cults sound like Christianity. Of course, if they didn't, there'd be, there'd be no danger. There'd be no subtlety. If they were obvious, patent, open contradictions, Nobody would ever fall into the snare. But the fact is that looking at them very generally, and if you're uncritical, you uh, will feel that these sound remarkably like Christianity. Indeed, they very often, almost generally, use Christian terms and terminology. Talk about Christ. Talk about these various blessings and so on. And the unwary feel, oh, well, this, this is Christianity. They're talking about Christ, they're talking about his death. Well, of course, if any man talks about Christ and his death, he must be right. He can't be wrong. Well, now, the moment you say that, you're already fallen. But they do that. They use the Christian terminology. They evacuate them, of course, of all their New Testament sense and meaning. But the terms are still there. And the uninitiated, the tyros, are completely taken in. This is Christian, they say. But using Christian science must be Christian. Says it's Christian. And so on. Now there's an illustration of what I mean. And then another general uh, characteristic, a thing which is common to them all is this. That they all obviously come and offer us very great blessings. Here again is a part of their whole secret of success. Yes, but I want to add this. They not only offer us blessings, they seem to be offering us blessings in a much more wonderful manner than the Christian church does. The Christian church, by contrast, seems slow and jaded and uninteresting and unexciting. These not only offer us blessings, they offer them in such a manner that we sort of kind of say to ourselves, well, how is it that we hadn't heard of this before and hadn't thought of this? This is just the thing, always in the most attractive manner conceivable. That, of course, must be a characteristic of them, otherwise they would never succeed at all. They know how to present their case. The devil is a master. We are discussing, you see, the wiles of the devil. There is no power, as it were, in the universe that knows how or so how to pack the parcel and to put on attractive paper and trimmings and adornments as the devil does. This is the essential part of the manifestation of his wiles. Now, this is, of course, therefore, the reason uh, why all these are so dangerous. Because the fact is that they're not Christian at all. That's why we call them cults. But here, I feel, is a point which is uh, very important for us. And one, I think, which is missed in some of the books that I've mentioned to you in their titles, even. You notice that I'm drawing a distinction between heresies and cults. And yet some of these books call themselves heresies, ancient and modern. Now, I don't regard these as heresies. I understand uh, how the, the confusion is made, but they're not heresies for this reason. That by definition a heretic is not a man who is essentially not a Christian. A heretic is a man who is a Christian, but who goes wrong at some particular point with regard to some particular doctrine. Whereas the whole point about the cults is that they're not Christian at all. They're counterfeits for Christianity. Now, you can't say that about a heretic or about a heresy. He's a man, I say, who just goes wrong in some particular point or instance. 
there is for the same reason, obviously, a difference between schism and the cult, and between apostasy and the cult. You remember we saw in the case of apostasy that the general body of Christian doctrine was held, but there were certain things added which rendered those null and void. But in the case of the cults, this general body is not held at all. It is not Christianity on any showing or in any way. So I believe it is a little important that we should be clear that the cults by definition are not Christian at all. And that is why our investigation is so important. Now another general characteristic of all the cults is this. That their devotees are always sincere. It's a great mistake to imagine that the followers of cults are not sincere. One of their troubles is very often is that they have zeal without knowledge, that they are so sincere that they refuse to think. They are carried away. They are sincere, they are enthusiastic, they are zealous, they are workers. Haven't you Christian people often been shamed by the way in which they show this zeal? They give up their Saturday afternoons to come round our houses selling books, walking about the streets with placards, doing this, that and the other. Their zeal, their good works are quite remarkable. Now, the New Testament, of course, uh, prepares us for all that. The Apostle was dealing with that in that third chapter of the second epistle to Timothy, which I read at the beginning. That is one of their characteristics. Always active, always zealous, full of good works, ready to make sacrifices. This is a characteristic of the cults, of course. It's not confined to the cults. You get the same thing in communism. You get the same zeal, the same sincerity, the same enthusiasm. You get it with many of the false religions as well as the cults. And so you always get this impression of something marvelous and wonderful that takes up the whole person, demands a kind of totalitarian allegiance because of its wonderful character and because of the results which it yields. Now there are certain general common characteristics which apply to them all. But now it will bring in our element of criticism. What are the characteristics uh, which enable us to differentiate between these cults and our Christian faith? And here are some of these things which I say you can apply to any one of the cults that may confront you. First, the whole question of origin. How have the cults ever come into being? Here's an interesting question of us. When you're confronted by a new teaching, the first question you should ask is, well, now, where's this come from? How did this start? Why this at all? You say you read back in the past centuries and uh, these things were non-existent then, which is interesting, you see, in and of itself. You say, when did this begin? You will generally find that it began in the last century. You will also generally find, and I'm simply stating this as a fact, that it started in the United States of America in the last century. Now, these things are therefore important. Last century, suddenly this thing appeared. How did it appear? Well, again, speaking generally. It has generally started as the result of a so-called revelation that was given to the founder. In other words, the, the claim is, and let me add another point which is curiously true of most of the cults. It isn't true of all of them, but it's true of most of them. That this revelation was given to a woman. Now, this isn't a matter of opinion, this is a matter of fact, which you can check by reading any of the books to which I have referred. The claim is that suddenly at a given point this person was given a revelation direct from God. And the whole movement and cult have arisen as the result of that. So, you see, the person is very important, the person to whom the revelation came. That's why I rather like that definition which said that it is devotion to a particular person. The founder is always of very great importance in all these cults. Must be, you see, because there is this authority of the revelation. Other people haven't had the revelation. It's the founder who had the revelation. Therefore, the opinions or the words or the teaching of the founder are unusually important, as I'm going to show you. Now, sometimes in addition, 
you will find that they claim not only that the founder had a revelation, but that he even discovered in a miraculous manner various documents which they claim have been written either by God himself or by angels. You see, the founder of Mormonism claimed that he found these documents written on pages of gold. Strangely enough, though this was supposed to have been written centuries before, it was written in the typical idiom of uh, the United States of America around about the 30s of the last century. However, that, that doesn't matter. The point is that they claim that the Book of Mormon was sent down from heaven and written, you see, not on ordinary papyrus or paper, but pages of gold. What's like gold, after all? You, this is what I mean when I talk about the wiles of the devil and the way in which the packet is presented. Not ordinary paper, but gold. There they were found. They'd been unfound for years, but this man was led miraculously to them, and thereby he found them. Well, now then, that is generally what you'll find about the origin. Now, this is, uh, of course, of very great significance. Heresies don't start like that, generally. What happens in the case of a heresy is that a man who has been a great student of the Bible and perhaps a preacher of the Scriptures, as the result of long study, gradually begins to go astray in his interpretation. He doesn't claim a revelation. He, it's a matter of interpretation. So uh, that is why I differentiate between heresies and uh, the cults. It's very rarely that the heretic has claimed this direct illumination or revelation from heaven. No, he says, look here, this is my study of the scriptures. I've been working this thing out. But in the case of the cult, it is always uh, this dramatic, unusual, and this element of a divine revelation. Now, this is really important because... It's a part of the exaggerated claim of the cult solvers. Oh, this, uh, these people there are expounding the scriptures to you. Anybody can do that, but you see, the man I'm following, this man had a revelation from heaven in a most amazing manner. Therefore, he's the man to listen to. It's unusual, it's extraordinary. The element of the miraculous comes in. And of course, that is what always gives it such a great impetus. That leads to the second point, which is this one. That the cults, therefore, always recognize and are governed by an authority additional to the Bible. In the case of Christian science, it's the book by Mrs. Eddy, Science of Health. See, that's authoritative. It was given to her by revelation, therefore that's authoritative. Now, it's very difficult to handle this matter because some of them do say they believe in the Bible and some don't. Some ignore it altogether. But the vast majority don't ignore the Bible. They claim to be unusual Bible students. You've had them at the door, haven't you? Ah, oh, they're the believers in the Bible. Well, but the trouble is this. They always have an authority additional to the Bible. And the authority is generally the writings of the founder. Either the writings of the founder or the recorded dictums, aphorisms, statements of the founder. And here is a kind of corpus of truth and of doctrine additional to the Bible. In the case of what is known as Seventh-day Adventism, which to me is doubtful as to whether it is a cult or whether it is a heresy, that doesn't matter. The authority there, of course, is that woman, Mrs. Ellen White, who again claims to have had this revelation, and the writings and the sayings of Mrs. White are fundamental and controlling. I know there's a movement now in that body to try to discount that, but nevertheless it's been there from the beginning. And of course it is, in a sense, essential to their whole position. Now they either ignore the Bible altogether, or they say, oh yes, the Bible's all right, but if you really want to understand the Bible, you must interpret it in the light of this, this which has come. Now there, of course, they resemble Roman Catholicism. It's a parallel at that particular point, that they have this extra authority, this extra understanding, this other revelation, and in practice, of course, whatever lip service they may pay to the scriptures themselves, the real authority is this other, this extra, this new, this direct revelation that has been given. Now, that is a very important point. 
And any teaching that may confront us, you must examine in terms of this second principle. Where exactly does the Bible come in? What is their view of the Bible? So often you'll find they bypass it altogether, as if it had never been written. Sometimes they'll use it for the purposes of illustration, but you see, they're not expanding the scriptures. It's this other thing. This thing is the thing that matters. It can be illustrated perhaps in this way, but it's this. It doesn't come out of the Bible. It isn't based upon it. It isn't an exposition of it, an exposure of it, a showing, an exegesis. It's not that. It's always this other thing. And the Bible assumes a subsidiary place and importance. And that in turn brings me to the next general category or canon of criticism. And that is that these cults always and invariably are wrong and go astray with respect to certain essential doctrines. Now this is a very large matter, of course, that should en could engage us almost endlessly. But what I'm asserting is this, that if you take the cardinal fundamental doctrines of the scriptures and test this cult of this teaching in the light of those, you will find that they're always in error and always go astray and always deny the vital truth. Now, of course, they don't all go wrong at the same place. But that really doesn't matter. That doesn't save them. There are certain absolutes. And to go wrong on any absolute is to put you outside Christianity. What are these absolutes? Well, some of them, you know, are even wrong about the doctrine of God himself, God the Father. God becomes just a force to some of them. Many of them don't believe in the creation and God as the creator at all. They believe in him as a great life force. They don't believe in him, in other words. It's a force, it's a power, it's an influence. It isn't true of all, I say, but it's true of great numbers of them. But, of course, it is when you come to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ that you will find most easily and obviously how they go astray. Most of the cults are not only uncertain, but are definitely wrong about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Most of them are Unitarian. They don't believe in his full and in his unique deity. They don't really believe in the incarnation and the marvel of the two natures in the one person. They're wrong about that. He's just a man to them, the supreme scientist, or the supreme religious genius, the great teacher. But the glory that we have here is generally absent. And, of course, it's exactly the same about his work, and especially the atonement. But I'll come back to that perhaps in a moment. Then, when you come to the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, you'll find the same lack. Generally, they ignore him altogether. He doesn't come in at all. If he does come in, he doesn't come in as a person. These cults don't understand anything about the doctrine of the Trinity. I mean by that. They're not even interested. They're not concerned. It isn't essential to their position. They operate, you see, on another level. They've got their formula, and that's the thing that does it. But here, essentially, it is the Trinitarian position, God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The great marvel and wonder about our salvation is the participation of the three blessed persons in your salvation and mine, not in the cults. The three persons may be denied, or any one of them may be denied, and that's enough. The Holy Spirit doesn't appear. Then, as I've already indicated, they're very shaky, many of them, about the whole question of creation. Indeed, some of these cults uh, thrive entirely because they're altogether wrong about creation and about the material universe. You see, Christian science rarely flourishes because it says there's no such thing as matter. And because there's no such thing as matter, there can be no such thing as disease. And there can be no such thing as pain. It's because it's wrong on the whole doctrine of creation and of matter. Because it utters such folly with regard to such matters. Leave alone its utter wrongness about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, whose name it uses. Even on a matter like that, it's the whole basis of its success. 
and of its supposed cures. It doesn't recognize matter. Then another doctrine which is most important as you evaluate these things is the biblical doctrine of sin. It's a hallmark of the cults always that they don't believe in sin. That's why I meant what I meant just now when I said that cults are often preached from so-called Christian pulpits. And you'll find that men have become very popular through preaching that there's no such thing as sin and that it's been very wrong to talk about sin and that the church by preaching a doctrine of sin has kept people down. No such thing as sin. No, no, you must believe in yourself and so on. Positive thinking. It's very popular in America today. The books are coming over here. It's been preached in this city of London. And it sounds so marvelous. No such thing as sin. You mustn't speak against yourself. You mustn't look down on yourself. Believe in yourself. You're wonderful if you only believed it. And what the Bible calls sin is an insult. We now understand all these things psychologically. None of the cults ever like sin. And of course for a very good reason. You're never going to be very popular if you preach the biblical doctrine of sin. And yet, you see, the cults must be popular, otherwise they can't get going. God isn't in them, so somebody's got to keep them going. And it's men who've got to keep them going. So you always pander to your people and you praise them. It's all so wonderful. They don't believe in sin. No such thing as sin. That's just bad psychology, we are told. And it's exactly the same about the doctrine of salvation. Obviously, if they don't believe in sin, you wouldn't expect them to be right about salvation. And they're not. They don't believe that the Son of God came from heaven to earth in order to take sin upon himself and to bear its punishment. They don't believe what Paul says, that he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. They don't believe Peter when he adds, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead unto sin should live unto righteousness. They don't believe in a substitutionary atonement. You never hear them talking about it at all. It's not essential to their method of salvation, but here it is absolutely essential. The Apostle Paul, in going to Corinth, says that he had determined not to know anything among them save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And yet the cults flourish without mentioning Jesus Christ and still less him crucified. They don't believe in sin. They don't believe in God's way of salvation. They deny the most glorious thing in the Christian faith, that the Son of God was made a sin offering that God laid our iniquities upon him. You never hear it from them. It's not essential. You can be right without it. It bypasses the cross. And it is damned for that reason as a counterfeit and a sham and a manifestation of the wiles of the devil. Anything that's wrong about salvation and especially about the cruciality of the cross he is not Christian. He is just a cult. However much it may bendy the name of Christ and Christian terminology and talk about love and a thousand and one other things, it is an utter denial. It is the counterfeit of the devil. And lastly, you will find that it's very good to test the cults always on the matter of prayer. Because they don't really believe in prayer either. And it's not surprising. In view of their wrongness about the matter of sin and salvation and the blessed persons of the Holy Trinity and our whole relationship to them, it's not surprising they don't know anything about prayer. What they know is their formula. They know nothing about a soul agonizing in prayer before God. They regard that as terrible as I hope to show you next Sunday morning. They know nothing about this waiting upon God, struggling in prayer, trying to lay hold upon God. It's not there. Not there at all. And as I say, it is not surprising. So it's very good always to test a cult on this practical, very practical matter of prayer. Do they really believe in prayer or something that at first sounds like prayer, but which on analysis turns out not to be prayer at all, but something very different. 
You see, these people, as I once heard a man putting it, he was preaching on the subject of prayer. And he had a title for his sermon. It's not difficult to put titles to your sermons if you're not expository, but very difficult if you are expository. You see, the title was this, Five Minutes a Day for Health's Sake. This was prayer. What was he teaching? Well, he was really teaching about uh, a form of coism, a man talking to himself. And you feel better as the result of doing it. You think beautiful thoughts. That was supposed to be prayer. And they even believe in a sort of thought transference. That if you think beautiful thoughts about another person, it will help that person to become beautiful. Or if you think healing thoughts about a person who is ill, and if a large number of you do it together, your thoughts somehow, and you see this eerie, semi-magical element so often comes in, it's this curious admixture of oriental philosophy and magic and mysticism and so on, the idea is that if a number of people think healing thoughts together, some of these thoughts are transferred through the ether. They're interested in the occult always, these people. So the person who's ill will gradually be healed by the healing thoughts. But all that is put in terms of prayer. You see, God doesn't come in. It's really not addressed to God at all. You are addressing your thoughts to the person who's ill, or the person who's in trouble, or the person who doesn't like you. It's you are directing of your thoughts. God isn't there. And the activity is not an activity on the part of God. It's your activity. But it's called prayer, of course. That's where the wiles of the devil come in. All these things are presented to us in Christian terminology. But the moment you examine them, you discover, as I say, that they're entirely evacuated of any true and real Christian content. Well, we have to leave it at that, unfortunately. But there, at any rate, are three big, broad tests by which we can and always should examine any one of these cults that may be presented to us. God, give us grace and wisdom. Oh, the subtlety of it all. Is it surprising that the apostle says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Take unto you the whole armor of God, that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Oh, the cleverness, the subtlety of it all. The devil is an angel of light, putting his clever, subtle counterfeit before us with the end and object of destroying our souls and robbing us of the glories of salvation in the Son of God. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.